Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. This is a special occasion for us because we enjoy studying our Sabbath School lesson every week. We're in a new series. Uh, we studied it, we, we began it last week. It's a series on the origins of our Earth. And this particular lesson is called Creation, Forming the World. It's lesson number two in this series for January 12 of 2013. We'd like to ask you to begin with us by bowing your heads as we have a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we wish we had a beautiful video that shows us exactly how you did each of these events of Creation Week step by step so that questions could be removed and there would be no room left for arguments, but that's not the case. We have such a simple account, a very plain, straightforward account of the events, and no other observers to report uh, on what happened. We believe your word. Help us to understand it in the proper way and to interpret it the proper way is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be focusing on this lesson, this uh, time together, on the first three days of Creation Week. This is this period that many scholars have referred to as the forming of our world. We have suggested on previous occasions there are many, many scientific variables that need to be exactly right for life to exist here on this Earth. Uh, I heard one scientist claim there were 49 such variables that have to be just precisely right or we couldn't exist. Um, atoms would fall apart or molecules would fall apart or there wouldn't be any oxygen or there wouldn't be any water on this world. All kinds of possibilities. Or the water would all be frozen solid. Um, does that sound like an accidental design? When God decided to create this world, he chose to take seven days to do it. Now, we believe that God is omnipotent. He could have snapped his fingers and created our world just like that without batting an eye. But he didn't. Why do you suppose he decided to take seven days? Ever thought about that? Was there even a day before he started creating? Did he create the day? Well, I mean, that's one of the issues that we're going to talk about. And if, if he created a day, how did he create the day? What makes it different than the night? And so forth. We'll talk about that. That's one of the issues. That would be our, the way the sun goes and the way the moon goes. Well, the day and the night, as we know them today, are determined by how the Earth spins around. So when we're spun around facing the sun, we have daytime. And when we're spun around facing the, I mean, with the, away from the sun, facing sometimes the moon, then we have night. So your question wasn't about time starting. You were talking about how time was divided into a day. Perhaps that was my question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, as it turns out, um, we have, many Christians have subtly fallen into a, a, a bad trap in understanding creation. They've fallen into what we sometimes call theistic evolution. Now, theistic evolution takes a number of different forms, and, and basically, let's, let's be clear about what we're talking about. We live in a world that is so dominated by scientific thinking that we somehow get the impression that science is the only solid thing there is. I mean, that's, that's just fixed and that's the way it is. And anything that we can't sort of test by immediate science is, well, maybe, maybe not, ethereal, whatever. And certainly something written 3,500 years ago. I mean, you know, how can you possibly rely on that? Well, that's a problem because um, in actual fact, if you think about it, God and his word are, are solid. They don't change. What changes is science. It changes all the time. There are new discoveries every day that change our, our field of medicine, that change every field of science. And yet we somehow have gotten into this mindset that science is fixed and that's the way it is. Well, anyway. Well, we, and we also think that man knows what he's doing. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, 
some some Christians have, have tried to hold on to the Bible with one hand and hold on to scientific modern scientific theories with the other, and they have suggested that maybe God originally put our matter here on this earth, or this earth and world, um, and with it he instilled inherently some kind of purpose, and then that purpose worked itself out through an evolutionary process. Um, how do you feel about that kind of an idea? I have very intelligent, college-educated friends who believe in theistic evolution, mm -hmm. and they are like embarrassed to not believe in science the way it is now, and they're very religious, and they seem to think that this is the way to bring them together. Mm -hmm. But when you start asking them, then there was death of organisms and animals before there was Adam and Eve. And what, when did God decide to create Adam and Eve in this cycle of evolution? Mm -hmm. And um, I can't even get them to talk about it. Yeah. But I know they go and they listen to speakers. A lot of the evangelicals um, are just avid believers in um, long age evolution. Mm -hmm. But I've never heard a good answer, or nor did they want to talk about, well, then when did Adam and Eve come in, and does God create by death? Yeah. I mean, and was there lots and lots of violence and death, at least among animals, before there was sin? I mean, we believe that sin is what brought in death. So that certainly is a conflict in ideas there. The impression I get out of... Genesis, the first chapter there that we're dealing with, and it goes back to, I think, your first question. God's methodical, and he makes a quality product. I don't have a problem with that. Yes, it's a little simple, but I think it beats the alternative. Yeah. You were talking about material at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? I didn't quite understand. <laughs> at first you were talking about material, then you were talking about life. Well... One of the important distinctions that is made in Scripture, which we need to understand, both in Hebrew and Greek, is that there was this ball of rock and molten metal and whatever it was, and, and of course we don't know if it was always like that or not, but as we have it today, there's this, this, this ball here that, that technically is called the earth. Um, and in the, in, in the Greek it has a different name, uh, and Hebrew has a different name, but then on on the thin spreadly <laughs> spread thinly, sorry, on the surface of that ball of rock and, and 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 molten metal and so forth is what we call our world. Uh, the world is cosmos, and that means the organized, living, reasonably um, civilized coating on our world, uh, on our earth. So the earth is the ball. And the world is what, is, and so the first question that comes up is, and, and let's just look at that. Look at Genesis 1, 1 and 2. My version says, in the beginning, when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. Then God commanded, and some things happened. So... That sounds like when God came here and decided to make a world out of our earth, it was this what we call. It was a ball of presumably rock covered with water, um, that there was something there. Now, of course, in our way of thinking, in my way of thinking, I presume yours as well, the idea would be that uh, God created this ball of rock and or molten metal inside, long time ago. I, I'm absolutely certain that nobody else created. It didn't come by chance. The ball was there beforehand. But the, the, the way the Hebrew is written, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but the way the Hebrew is written, it doesn't require that the earth was created at the same time that the world was created. The earth might have been here for millions of years. The rock. The, the well, all it does tell you is that the, the earth was here, there was water. Uh -huh. It was dark. Yeah. It doesn't really say anything else. No. 
So when you added the molten stuff and all that, you're just kind of assuming that. Well, I, I'm saying that's what we have now. Yeah. Whether it's always been like that, I don't I have no way of knowing. The other interesting thing to me is one of the first things they hammer at you as a high school kid, and I think it was chemistry so far back, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Mm -hmm. That kind of limits God right there. Mm -hmm. That's from our perspective. Well, was we that know that. that public school? Yeah. Yeah, oh, way back. Yeah, I can still hear it. But, I mean, if you believe in creation, we, God we, can't be limited. He could yes. have done anything. So God can speak and create but the public school, uh, school scientists didn't believe that. That's right. Well, but I mean, the point, the, the public school scientists have already been disproved because when we set off nuclear explosions, we destroy matter. We turn it into energy. Mm. So, so that's, back then that they, statement is not true. Uh, so they were very solid in their science back then, but it's no longer true. Well, I think <laughs> there's probably still people believe it. Yeah. Well, actually, isn't it that when you destroy matter, it turns into air energy? Mm -hmm. But you can, the energy could theoretically be put back together for matter again. But the only one who's ever been able to do that, that we know about, is God. God that's why but um, it may be that we don't know the technology because, right? because um, you could, a few years ago you could say, well, nobody's been able to fly except God and mm -hmm. birds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Before mo um, modern science, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he argued that God did not create things in, in their final states. Mm -hmm. He believed that everything had potential to develop. So it's a form of uh, means of, you know, God creating life by means of evolution. He tried to marry the two. And that's we, a long time ago. And just to show you how important these issues are, we have spent billions of dollars trying to discover whether there's water on the moon, right. on Mars, etc. And why is that? I we don't know any way that life as we know it could exist without water. So if there's not water there, we are pretty sure there's no life as we know it. Now, um, our Genesis 1, 1, or 1 and 2 say that this earth was covered with water back maybe even before this world was created. So this earth is, is very different. Um, and by the way, there's some other verses in the Bible that are very interesting in that respect. Look at Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, verse 9. Clear at the other end of the Bible. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or, or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth. Notice, not the world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. And when the Garden of Eden was created, who was there? The devil, Satan, the, the serpent. In the, in the tree garden. of knowledge of good and... So apparently the devil was thrown down to the earth before the world was created. Now just a minute. Okay. The earth is the formless void thing? The, the rock. The, 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 the That's the earth. Yes. And the world is the vegetation and animals on the earth. It, the surface, the thing that we know, this, all of this surface, this thin surface that sits on top of the world. Is on the, the world. Earth. Now, is that from your Bible definitions or? No, that's, that's what the words mean in the ancient language. Oh, okay, because I use earth by, and I mean all the plants and vegetations too. So. Yeah. The earth is the formless void mm -hmm. ball in space. Yes. And then the world is what, when God did it, mm -hmm. creation mm -hmm. and stuff. And so Satan was thrown down to the earth. earth. So he was thrown here before God started the days of creation. Apparently so. So uh, Satan got to see creation firsthand, huh? Yes. Oh, yeah. He also got solitary, didn't he? Yeah. So, so wh know. what are you imagining when you say without form, void? Um, I think it just said that it was a molten rock with water over it. Yeah, that's what Genesis 1 well, was. That's, that's a form, isn't it? It could have been space junk. We don't know. We really don't know. Is that how you look at it? You can see the space We've junk? got asteroids going all around. Maybe this was an asteroid with a little more under. I don't know. To me, it, it doesn't bother Technically, it is a form. Me. It's a ball. It's a sphere. Mm -hmm. Well, see what it says. Let's read it again. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate, 
The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. Now, think about that for a moment. What that means is the, the ball, whatever you choose to call it, was a perfect sphere already. Because if it was not a perfect sphere, what would happen? The water would all, all go to the deepest part and leave the dry land sticking out, right? This says everything was covered by water. Okay? It doesn't really say it was a sphere formless and the raging ocean. So it had salt water. <laughs> well, the raging ocean that covered everything yeah. was engulfed in total darkness. Okay, so it, had, so to it had to be a perfect sphere for it to be covered all by water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. That's the way I interpret that, right? Well, it depends what you mean by water. Oh, come on. We, uh, no, no, no. There's, what do you there's, mean by water? There is, there's um, three forms of water. Isn't yes, there? but you can't, you can't cover rock with, with steam. Sure you, you can. How? Clouds. Clouds cover the, the earth. Never they can. cover and they're full of their water. Well, well, you know, yeah. these are all technical well, things, but, you know, you, well, can't, you can't just throw them out and say that it, that's not possible. Well, what about Job? I think Jerry might be onto something. But, um, where were you? Job yeah, 38. He yeah. talks 38, about 38, 40, 48. Yeah, where were when you I in the wrapped. covered uh, uh, thick clouds and the earth was its, or darkness was its swaddling? Mm -hmm. uh, how does that go? Well, it's, in, it's darkness. It talks about it there. Well, it's wrapped wrap the earth with, with bands of clouds. When, cl when clouds, it's garment, and thick darkness, it's, it's swaddling. So you had, uh, to begin with, you had clouds, or uh, fog, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You couldn't see. Finally, you, your light comes through, but you still can't see the stars. So mm. on the fourth day, the, the water of the cloud, water vapors of the cloud has gone away, and now you can see the stars. Yeah, and I'm not arguing with that, and I'm not arguing with the idea of the clouds either. I, but it seems to me, based on what I read, at least I understand it, is that there's also water covering the ball sure. underneath. There may be clouds up above. And, there's and God's power to deal with the waters, to separate water. Let's face it, water is going to do its own thing. It's going to find its own level. But God could separate the waters. That was one demonstration. And then you had the time when Jesus was on the boat on the, on the Sea of Galilee and the storm come up and he says, peace be still. And the waters obeyed him. So he has the power over. And yeah, and the reason I question about the clouds is because of verses 6 and 7. Then God commanded, this is the second day, let there be a dome to divide the water and to keep it in two separate places. And it was done. So God made a dome and it separated the water under it from the water above it. He named the dome sky. So at least as my, my simple understanding, I would say that was probably the time when there was air and there was, and there was clouds. There's some scholars though, that believe that they, they thought that the, the, the dome was actually something that lifted the water up above mm -hmm. the earth. Well, and the, it, um, yeah. you had water underneath, you had the water above the dome type mm -hmm. of thing. Because, you know, the, the Bible's always talking about the storehouses of, of hail or whatever up there. Well, I so, mean, you mean it, the ancients didn't know anything about gravity. I mean, they, they knew about it practically, that you, if you fall, you know, lean over you too far, you fall down, that kind of stuff. But they knew anything about how it worked in terms of supporting things in space and so forth. So they looked up and they saw, you know, bright things or even birds flying up there. And they said there, there must be some kind of a more solid substance up there that holds those things up. Because, you know, you, you can't be held up <coughs> without, uh, without something to hold you up there. Even the stars, they believed there was a, a firmament. That's what, that's what that means, is the idea there must be something solid up there to hold those things in place. And that was just a mistaken idea they had. You know, um, doesn't God, he separated the water from the land, mm -hmm. and he says the water will go this far and no further? Mm -hmm. That's on the third day. Well, you know, when I go to the beach, you see the water and it stops. And I think water... You, you go thus far and no farther yeah. because there's all this development right after the beach. And then when, like in the end times, didn't, doesn't it say something about the waters will overflow their boundaries? Yeah. Yeah. And so they will, and then we have those tsunamis. And so I'm going, God, please hold the water thus far and no farther 
yeah. because what damage it would do to California to, to go any further. And it's kind of spooky standing on the edge of the water and wondering why it just stops right there. And yeah. you think, I think God is still holding the water thus far and no farther. And that, you know, we recently had some terrible storms on the east coast of the United States, and they reported that there were some beaches lost 150 feet of beach mm -hmm. in that storm. In the, in the end times, the water the average was like 30 feet. Yeah, the waters will overflow their line mm -hmm. that God has set. Jim had mentioned Job 38. Look at this. What does this tell us about creation? Look at Job 38, starting with verse 4. Were you there when I made the world? If you know so much, tell me about it. Who decided how large it would be? Who stretched the measuring line over it? Do you know all the answers? What holds up the pillars that support the earth? Now, once again, this is, you know, fitting with their ideas of ancient, you know, their ancient thinking. Who laid the cornerstone of the world? In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Who closed the gates to hold back the sea when it burst from the womb of the earth? Who covered the sea with clouds? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you can picture, I've, I've seen it at a time when uh, it got so c uh, dark with, with uh, storm clouds that it got dark and the street lights came on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you'd think it was night, but it wasn't. It was in the middle of the daytime. And uh, you yeah. go out on a nice uh, morning, uh, it'd be foggy as all get out, and you can't see the stars. Yeah. But then you clear away all that moisture and you can see the stars. So that could have been what happened on the fourth day. Everything else was out. I'm not saying God didn't create it. God, uh, give God credit for doing er all of that. But it, we just can't, we, we're surmising from what we know now. We uh, really we do. don't fully understand. Yeah. You don't get control of the oceans until you get tides. You get tides from the, where the moon and the earth are in relation to each other as things go around. And the sun. And the sun. I mean, it's all into... We don't really know if it was working like that then, but when he started putting it together, maybe he fine-tuned it. We don't know. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interesting questions in the Bible, and a lot of verses scattered through Scripture that talk about things that have implications for our thinking. Uh, we have prepared a, a, a little handout that you might find interesting to, to look at before you actually discuss this, this lesson with your um, other members in your classes. It's found on our website. Our website is called theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And uh, it's under resources. It's a handout entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture. And it talks about who was there at creation, what were they doing, what was the role they were playing, and so forth. You might find that interesting to look at. Now, who was watching God do this? Okay, Satan was down on the earth experiencing this stuff that was happening. Along with his, said, all his angels. Along with and what they were demons then mm -hmm. when they yeah. were thrown out. And then uh, it says the stars were singing. Yes. Is that the angels or the beings in heaven were singing as, and shouting for joy as God did this one day, yes. two days? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh. and the, the, the morning stars are referred to in some other places. Uh, Satan was called the morning star before he, while he was still Lucifer. And so these are beings presumably from other worlds and other universes. Ours, I don't think ours, I'm sure our world is not the only inhabited planet out there. There's other planets that are inhabited in other parts of the universe. And in Revelation, does it say that then we are going to witness the world being recreated new? Mm -hmm. So after the resurrection, then God will do it again and we can watch? And after the total destruction of sin and sinners and God is ready to start all over again, I think, you can't prove this from the Bible, but I think God being the kind of compassionate and understanding teacher that he is, he'll say, would you like to see how I did that the first time? Let me do it just the same again. Day one, day two, day three. I think it's very likely that that's what will happen. He'll say, watch this, you scientists. Yes, exactly. I, th I think there's another facet to this that we don't often think of, but with our technology today, with radio telescopes and the like, there are, they can identify constellations and stars in 
quote unquote, by their frequency. You can hear it. You can hear it come over. Some are straight sounds and some are variable. It could be stars singing too. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, it seems like from, from Job 38 that God is talking about the whole universe watching as he's making this, this new earth. And they're watching the earth very closely because Satan, who caused trouble in heaven, mm -hmm. that troublemaker and his, and his friends, were down on this earth yep. that God then was creating. And everybody was watching like, okay, what is going to happen on this earth? Why is God, why doesn't he just leave Satan and those demons there in that formless, voidless? Why does he create something beautiful and, and Satan's down there? So yep. that's when the great controversy started. Here on this earth, is, uh -huh. is, yeah. Well, is it possible that God created the rocks and maybe even the water here on this earth a long time before he created the world as we know it? The Bible does not teach us exactly when the earth as opposed to the world was created. Now, we remember we've made the distinction between the earth being the ball of stone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the world being the thin layer of, of life and, and vegetation, etc., uh, surrounding uh, uh, laid over top of that earth. Um, I don't think it's too thin because some of the mountains are 10,000 feet high. So Well, but it turns out that if you, if you take our earth and you compare it uh, compared to the size of the earth and then the amount of variation up at the top, that our earth is actually smoother than a, smoother than a billiard ball. Smoother than a billiard ball. So... Um, who are the beings described in Job 38? We've already talked about that. I think a clue is, is found in Job 1, verse 6. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord. Now, that's why I don't think it's probably this. I know the, the stars make, you know, various noises, but this is the heavenly beings appearing before the Lord. I think those are individuals that came. It says, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, Where have you, what have you been doing? Satan answered, I've been walking here and there, roaming there to, around the earth. So there are beings of some kind that showed up in heaven for some kind of a meeting, some kind of a conference. And there they are. Okay? And that's, that's repeated again in, in Job 2, verse 1. Um, one thing is very clear from all of this. Um, give me a second to get my computer back in place here. God made our world to be inhabited. And it just specifically says so in Isaiah 45, 18. Just look at that. The Lord created the heavens. He is the one who is God. He formed and made the earth. He made it firm and lasting. He did not make it a desolate waste, but a place for people to live in. It is he who says, I am the Lord, and there is no other God. He even said, be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Clearly, God stated that the earth, before he began his work with it, was unfit for habitation. It is important for us to recognize that even if the earth was created long before this world, God was not in any way dependent upon pre-existing matter in his creative process. And Ellen White spells that out in considerable detail. Volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 258, paragraph 4. Minister of Healing, 414, paragraph 3. And The Faith I Live By, page 24, paragraph 3. It's possible that God used some matter that he had previously created when he made our world, or just possible that he created entirely new matter. In either case, it was matter that he himself had created at one time or another. This is what bothers me when the scientists measure the matter. God could have created maturity. He created Adam and Eve as mature people. So he could have created a mature rock, tree, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and then... Uh, well, that's the problem. God can do anything. Uh -huh. yeah. So when God can do anything, well then, how can you... Scientists is saying, no, no, put no, something done. Do yeah. Well, I don't know. In a way, it's kind of a bad news, too, because you can't really... You can't really look at everything and try to figure how to, uh, he did everything, because everything you can come up with he can short circuit it and make it, make things go around it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard to prove God. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's hard to prove how things 
how to explain a lot of things that that you're actually seeing because people just believe that God can do anything. So L look at the next three verses after after verses one and two, starting with verse three through five. How do you understand this? Actually, yeah, three through five. Then God commanded, let there be light. And light appeared. God was pleased with, notice light appeared. It doesn't say it was created necessarily. It appeared. God was pleased with what he saw. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and he named the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed and morning came. That was the first day. What do you think happened on that day? Now, what do we know about uh, light from other places in Scripture? Hmm? We know that God is a tremendous light. Yes, God is light. And the Bible says that in several places. Right. So how he relates to, how his light would relate to that, I'm not sure I understand. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly sources of light other than our sun to, yes. to be had. Yes. So Perfect. how can you... Could so be it still could come from the sun. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, as, I mean, the first day, he could have just thinned that dark cloud out a little bit, and, mm -hmm. the, and the light would come. Mm -hmm. Did the so sun exist possible. at this point? Well, we don't know. That's a discussion. Oh, That's a discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because even, even when it says, talks about the sun, you can interpret it as it was allowed to come out. And so. That's true. It's even possible that our sun was just a ball of matter up there, and God says, okay, burn. We, we, there's lots of possibilities. See? Obviously atomic, according yeah. to our way of looking at it. He could have just got it rolling. A nuclear reaction, That's yeah. Right. So um, there, were, there were no previous, I mean, we're not going to try to suggest that God was not light, or that there were no previous stars, suns, or even any other source of light before, you know, day, day one. Obviously, that would be crazy. Well, um, there's, there's two ways to look at it. Either you believe what's being told here is the beginning of all things, or it's an event that, that happened with time that had started a long time before, mm -hmm. which um, there's support for that. Yeah. The real issue, though, is did God do it mm -hmm. or did it happen by some other mechanism? He says, he, he kind of gives us a story of how, how he did it. Uh, we try to be real exact and scientific about it, and there's not enough data to do that. Mm -hmm. But we have to make the decision, do we believe that he did it or was there some other force or some other mechanism in which he was not involved. And that's the only real issue. Now, one of the things that we need to be aware of is this. Uh, Gary has already suggested that the stars, other stars emit uh, radio frequency waves and different, different frequencies actually. Into. The truth is our eyes can only see approximately one octave in, in, in radio fre in frequency. We see from this point to that point, and that's one, one octave. Um, and so maybe all of a sudden God says, let things appear in that spectrum, right. which wasn't there before. And other beings in other worlds use a different spectrum. We, there's lots of possibilities here. Um, I'll tell you, uh, te technologically, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays some people may not be aware of this, but they have televisions out now and I know some of the inventors of this, that uh, you can be in a room, everyone can be watching the same screen, and by the glasses that you're wearing, you can be watching a different program mm -hmm. off of the same screen. Mm -hmm. So exactly what you said is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so... We just don't know exactly how I'll, how I'll do this. One other possibility is this. It's possible that, you know, our Earth, I mean our Moon, is heavier on one side. It always, the heavy side always stays facing our Earth. As it goes around, it stays, and there's the dark side on the other side of our Moon uh, that we, we, we never, never knew. It doesn't rotate. 
it, it doesn't rotate. Uh, yeah, it goes around. It goes around our Earth, but the the heavy side always stays facing our Earth. There's very few things in the universe that does that. And I think mm -hmm. there was something else that I heard about, but they yeah. remarked well, about the moon. I, th I think all the moons in the maybe you may be right. I don't well, know. how cute! So yeah. God made our moon heavier on one side, so it would stay facing towards the Earth. Well, the gravity's different up there too. Yeah, yeah. But I, now actually, it is turning though. But it's turning. As it goes around the, the but it's earth, it's it's con it's controlled by the weight, so that the heavy side always stays facing our Earth, which is we are the biggest, the biggest gravity source close to the moon, so it, the heavy side stays toward us. In relationship to the sun, it spins. Yeah, <laughs> but in relationship to the Earth, it yeah. Now in what? creation, these were God's ideas to do this. Mm -hmm. And wasn't the world created through Jesus? Wasn't Jesus like yes. the craftsman yes. that actually did what God, God's bidding? Yeah, that's what Scripture as, says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one other possibility that I don't know how all this would fit together, but since our days our nights are created by the spinning of our earth, maybe our earth used to be sitting still, and so one side was brilliant white, and just very hot, and the other side was, was cold because it was away from the sun, and God says, okay, now I'm going to even the temperatures out by starting the spin. So he starts to spin, and all of a sudden, now you have a day, and now you have a night, and now you have a day, and now you have a night. That's another possibility. Um, don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. And he started the spin at the right speed so mm -hmm. things wouldn't fly off. Yeah. I don't know. I, we just don't know. And it's slowing down as we speak. <laughs> but isn't there a school of thought also that says our Earth is not sitting square, it's tilted? Yeah. So that has an effect yeah. too. Are there, some people say that the tilting happened at the time of the flood. Who knows? But yeah. without, the, without the tilting, we wouldn't have seasons. That's right. That's right. Since it's quite clear that uh, life was not created for the first time when our Earth was created, what is the meaning of, of these verses? Uh, the day and the night as we know them are created by the spin of our earth. Is it possible that God set our earth spinning at that point in time, thus creating day and night? God clearly named light day and darkness night, thus implying that since he created them, he's in charge of them. Well, anyone who has stood outside on a clear night realizes that there are many other sources of light besides our sun. It is possible that this earth was surrounded by thick clouds before God began his creative action here. And many places, God himself is described as light. For example, 1 John 1, 5, Revelation 21, 23, and Revelation 22, 5. There's some other possible explanation for those words as well. So people have looked at this and struggled with these issues so much time that I think we have almost pretty much every possibility of every interpretation has been thought about. The next thing that happens is in Genesis 1, 6 to 8. Let's have a look at that. Then God commanded, let there be a dome to, to, to divide the water and to keep it in two separate places, and it was done. So God made a dome and it separated the water under it from the water above it. He made, named the dome sky, evening passed and morning came. That was the second day. Okay, so what happened on the second day? Read you the verses, tell me what you think happened. We got the oceans and water vapor. Waters. Okay. Well, what well, if what if the um, the Earth was foggy first day, mm -hmm. and the water is falling down, getting mm -hmm. thinner and thinner out of the atmosphere, and on the second day, the fog was gone away, but now you you have an overcast, you have water on the ground. Mm -hmm. So now you've got you've got a dome or a, a room now. The, the word in Hebrew that describes the firmament or the dome or whatever you choose to call it is an actually interesting word, rakia. It means to stamp something until it becomes very thin. Mm. Stamp it thin. Mm. And I think that's a perfect word to describe our very thin world that sits on top of our Earth. The atmosphere that sits on top yeah. of our Earth. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Somebody, doesn't that also, couldn't that mean that when people used to stamp bowls, mm -hmm. they used to beat them out? Yeah. Well, that 
that causes the ball, which causes the dome. So you could say that th that is the dome being created also. It just depends it's, how you yeah. interpret it. Well, this is, was often used, most often used in ancient times, to talk about beating metal to thin. Right, that's what I'm saying. You're making a, you're making a ball by beating the metal mm -hmm. and making it thin. Okay, so now you've got the model of the dome that's happening. So the dome is, has been created. I'm also, it's as though he created a space. Mm -hmm. uh, a space, a firmament, a place later where birds would fly yeah. and, and, and the like. Yeah. It's, these, these rakia thin coverings were often metal coverings that were used on top of wood or, or some cheaper metal to make idols. So you make a thin layer of gold and you put it on top of a, a wood idol or a, a, an iron idol or something like that. When um, you're saying firmament, are you just saying the air mm -hmm. it's the atmosphere the, the atmosphere it's the atmosphere and all of its components mm -hmm. the higher you go the thinner it is the marvel to me yeah, is that it stays here it must have gravity and it, it doesn't yeah. go out it that's, stays that's here. one of the things that that's marvelous we're talking about a vault vault though this that's specific isn't it a vault when you create the vault a vault just i mean i don't know they're different Vault has different meanings. The word vault has different meanings. Yeah, but the meaning here... The meaning here... Is he created the vault. The... The, the dome. The dome. Well, I doesn't know... I, yeah, that's... We call it the atmosphere because we know what we're talking Sky. about. Sky. Yeah, because, uh, because we're in the more NIV, scientific. In the NIV, it says uh, expanse. Expanse is what it says. But this, this is interesting about the dome because our atmosphere around our planet is, yeah. depending upon where you are, is dome-like mm -hmm. all, all around all the Earth. Around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, it's a very thin layer. You know, our atmosphere goes out 20 miles is the, I mean, the way outside reach. If it would be, you know, we call that stratosphere out there, about 20 miles. If you think of a 20-mile layer, Top, sitting on top of a, of a world that is 8,000 miles in diameter. That's a very thin layer. You know what's interesting is this just a, it, like a parent. Okay, when some a lady's pregnant, you start getting the baby room ready. Mm -hmm. And you put in the crib, you put in this, you put in that. Well, God was getting a room, space. a space, a play area, a live area ready for his children. Mm -hmm. And that's all he's doing here. And it's very clear that he proceeded very methodically. He didn't, he didn't, like, wasn't trying to pull the wool over somebody. He said, watch me do this, watch me do this, watch me do this. And another thing that he did, which I admire, is he knew problems would come down the line. Mm -hmm. And so he prepared play, uh, things, herbs that could be used as medicine, even mm -hmm. before there was sin in the world. Mm -hmm. So when he was preparing our room, our place where we live, mm -hmm. He was anticipating problems and putting all this into the room so that when the problem came, he would say, look into the room what I've made for you. Yeah. Did you notice that after every day's work, God pronounced it good? Yes. But on the dome, he didn't say anything. <laughs> well, so does, is there some significance to that? Maybe it, because it wasn't finished. It's Maybe. empty. Mm-hmm. Uh, also in verse 8, uh, the term sky in Hebrew is plural. It's heavens. Mm -hmm. And I he, don't understand why that is. He pronounces it good in verse 18. He what? wasn't... The uh, dome? The, well, the he doesn't... Day? He is... Pro he pronounces the end of each day good. He just... He doesn't on the second day, though. Or the dome day, I'm sure. Well, verse 18 is the second day, isn't it? That's the fourth day. Yeah. End of the third day. Comes well, the end of the start third with day. verse 9 now. Let's, let's see where it takes us, because we're, we're, our time is, is, is running. Okay. Then God commanded, let the water below the sky come together in one place so that the land will appear, and it was done. So now we have dry land, and we have oceans. This is a very interesting verse right here. Yes. It seems that if we study 
the history of the world, it seems that all of the water was gathered together in one place. Land was seemed to be one place, which consequently would mean that the water was in the other place. Mm -hmm. So this is very significant verse right here. Of course, there are thousands of verses like that throughout the Bible that are very significant. Mm -hmm. He named the land earth, and the water which had come together he named sea. And God was pleased with what he saw. Then he commanded, let the earth produce all kinds of plants, those that bear grain and those that bear fruit. And it was done. So the earth produced all kinds of plants, and God was pleased with what he saw. Evening passed and morning came. That was the third day. And by the way, there's no, it was good on the third day either. <laughs> really? He's busy working. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the NIV it does say, End of verse 12. Yes, and God saw that it was good, right before verse 13. That's right. <laughs> and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Mm -hmm. I okay, looked at it, it very carefully. It's, it's, there's just the one day. Where maybe it's, okay, maybe my, in the in, Hebrew, though. In my version, it doesn't have that. Oh, maybe there's some it's controversy. Some I got the American Standard says the same thing. Mm. American Standard <laughs> says, yeah. NIV says. That, that it was good. Yes. Mm -hmm. or At the also. end of verse 12. I'm sorry, it does say he was, mine says he was pleased with what he saw. So, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, we now have light. We have water above and water below. We have dry land. Dry land and now the dry land is producing. 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 Greenery, okay? Um, Which is interesting because the way I read it here in, in the New American Standard, these trees were fruit bearing with seeds. They were going. This yeah. was not seedlings. This stuff yeah. was functioning. Mm -hmm. It had apparent age. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but I've never really noticed that before. It's interesting that in the th these three days of, of creation, the first three days of creation, we have three divisions. Light was separated from darkness. The water above was separated from the water below. The dry land was separated from the seas. And you can think of those as spaces mm -hmm. that God is going to fill mm -hmm. in later days. Yes. When studying the layers of the earth, geologists notice that below the Cambrian layer, those of you who know about those, all those layers. Below the Cambrian layer, there are almost no forms of life. Now, some people are saying, yeah, maybe there's some the bacteria, bacteria or something <laughs> down there. Maybe they crawl down there later. Yeah. Then suddenly, about that level, above that level, there are many kinds of life. What do you think? Considering, one, all the different fossil forms that have been discovered, and two, the fact that even today, certain species of animals and plants are disappearing from our planet, as far as we can tell, were there more differences in life forms back in the beginning, or are there more differences in life forms today? It seems that there were more life forms uh, prior to today. Back in the beginning. Back in the beginning. Which makes it kind of hard to understand how a creative evolutionary process that is making more and more and more, when in reality, you look at the record, and it's getting less and less and less. Yeah. Well, even from the very lowest levels in the geologic column, or from the earliest times in history, we see, we see an incredible diversity of life forms. This is not a picture suggesting a single ancestor giving rise to several different forms, which eventually led to more different forms, just as you suggested, Norm. For example, does it even make common sense to believe that the incredible variety of fruits and vegetables happened by chance? Try to imagine the variety of fruits that must have been available to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Oh, the biggest decision was trying to figure out which one to eat. <laughs> what are we going to eat tonight? <laughs> yeah, right. Didn't God say something about the animals would, would stay within their own kind? The animal, well, we're going to get to that we're right gonna now. We're going to get to that, okay. Mm -hmm. um, remember that vegetables were not added to our diet until they were outside the Garden of Eden. Right. When Adam and Eve were required to leave the Garden of Eden, what did they eat? 
Did the necessary plants just suddenly appear in the territory around them? They had in the Garden of Eden, hadn't they? Were those plants mature and ready to be eaten? I mean, obviously God didn't wait for a whole growing season before Adam and Eve had anything to eat. Or did Adam and Eve carry with them seeds from the Garden of Eden? Or were the life forms in the Garden of Eden completely different than any of the life forms which we have now? We don't know. Yeah. Well, in, in chapter 2 of Genesis, it starts out by saying that God, God planted the garden. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like there was something special about that little area there yeah. that needed to be done, and that could answer those questions. Yeah. Well, whatever happened, and we hope one day to see the whole history in 3D living color, I, I'm really looking forward to that. It is clear that all was created by God's omnipotent power. He spoke and it happened. And that, that theme is presented in numerous places in Scripture. Psalm 33, 6 and 9, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Isaiah 55, 11, o Old Testament and New Testament. God spoke and it happened. It, wouldn't it be kind of interesting and maybe kind of God-like after the earth is destroyed and there's nothing left and he recreates it, Mm -hmm. that he would do it in a similar manner. You guys have been arguing about how this goes on. Let's do it again, and I'll show you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's a big hope from it is. a lot of people. <laughs> I, Even in the New Testament, there are many references to the history of, cre of creation. Second Peter 3 is a good example. Those who choose to believe an evolutionary explanation for the origins of things on this earth have to deny the clear testimony of scripture from beginning to end. Now when Jesus <clears throat> excuse me was on earth did he speak of creation? Oh yes. So people believe in Jesus and but not what Jesus says about creation? Well I mean take example the simple example is John 1 1. Now John 1 I mean John 1 the first chapter uh, that wasn't written while Jesus was here on this earth, but it's a description of what John concludes from the whole life history of Jesus. And he, he says right there, not anything was created that was created except by Jesus, by the Word. Um, yeah. The written account written down by Hebrew prophets is the only one where God simply speaks and it happens. I mean, other, there are other creation stories, many, many of them, scattered around the world. Almost every ancient culture you can find has some kind of a creation story. But all, universally, those stories are violence and death and wars and so forth create, I mean, gods get angry at each other and they kill at one god and they tear him apart and throw him here and there and that becomes the earth. I mean, you know, does that sound logical to you if God is love? So our view of creation um, educates us or gives us our opinion of mm -hmm who we think God is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we think God was a violent God and created through death, that colors our view of God. Yeah. If we think God spoke and made all this beauty with sinless, that, that mm -hmm. gives us the opinion of God. Well, we've already talked about this, but let me just think about, just mention this once again. If God is love, and he has compassion, and he teaches us to be considerate of the weak and the poor and so forth like this. You know, the poor you have with you always and, and, and support them and help them. How could that God have created our world through an evolutionary process where the strong dominate the weak and they destroy the weak so they can reproduce faster, whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, it just does not seem... Clearly, clearly that is not how it happened, and mm -hmm. even Darwin himself uh, did not believe in, in many of his hypotheses, especially uh, regarding, he said, the eye. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, perhaps you could speak better on that, but he said it's impossible, there's not enough time. So yeah. Darwin himself, so if Darwin didn't believe in Darwinism, uh, we should no longer believe in <laughs> Darwinism. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at these words from Ellen White. I, I love these words. As the earth came forth from the hand of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, and interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abounding in terrific steeps and frightful chasms, 
as they do now do, the sharp, ragged edges of the Earth's rocky framework were buried beneath the fruitful soil, which everywhere produced a luxuriant growth of verdure. There were no loathsome swamps or barren deserts. Graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye at every turn. The heights were crowned with teas, trees more majestic than any that now exist. How tall are the tallest trees that we know about now? About 300 feet. About 300 feet. That's really up there. The air untainted by foul miasma is clear and healthful. The entire landscape outvied in beauty the decorated grounds of the proudest palace. I don't know how many of you've all seen pictures, I'm sure, of Versailles, for example, and how everything is just spotless and trimmed. And she says, it came head forth from the hand of God way more beautiful than that. The angelic host viewed the scene with delight and rejoiced at the wonderful works of God. Many people of a scientific bent have real questions about Genesis 1 to 11 and wonder how could something so complicated be described in this very simple language. And I have a challenge for such people. I want you to think about this question. Let's just propose theoretically that God could, since Moses wrote this material, that God could have somehow explained all the laws of physics as we now know them and all the laws of physics that we still don't even know. And, and then he could have explained everything to Moses. And Moses understood it all perfectly, exactly how did it and how the laws all worked to, to produce all that and so forth. Who would he tell? <laughs> they wouldn't. There was not another person who had a clue. Even if he understood it, he couldn't possibly have written it down in language. There was no language to describe it. There was no one who could have understood it if he tried to describe it. So, Simple story. Yeah. Does the orderliness of the created, creative process tell us anything about God's plans for our lives today? We know that instead of creating billions of human beings, God created two, a male and a female. Apparently, Charles Darwin got his initial idea about the evolutionary process from the islands of Galapagos. David L. Hall stated, the God of the Galapagos is, a, is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. This is not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. Well, as we've seen already, there are lots of questions that can be raised about these early stories. Obviously, God didn't choose to make a detailed account of everything. But we'll let you think about it. We'll continue our story next week. See you then. Thank you.